Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 701, 701, Friday, February the 22nd, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, well, <laughs> yesterday's video I said, well, uh, Jesse uh, is probably going to be charged. The, I said by Friday night he'll be in handcuffs. Well, it didn't take that long, did it? <laughs> nope, it surely didn't. So, uh, yes, he has been charged and it looks like not only charged with the uh, fraudulent attack on himself, but it looks like they are saying that he also was responsible for putting this letter together, uh, sending it to himself, and that's what started everything. And that makes it a more serious matter because that, that automatically makes it a federal crime, and that means that he is almost certainly going to uh, federal prison. Was, I can't imagine him getting out of federal prison because... I think he really ticked off the Chicago police at this point because even after they had figured it out, um, then he, he, he played with them, and I don't think they appreciated that. Um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, sympathy for this guy uh, in the courtroom by the judge, by the jury, by the police. I think he's going to probably uh, pay some hefty fines, and uh, he's going to, obviously, I think he's going to go to federal prison uh, for this um, devious act. And it was because, you know, let's look at this thing another way. He's actually very, very lucky that the only thing that happened was a bunch of left-wing media hacks and Hollywood types uh, bought into his scam and looked like fools. It could have been a lot worse because he very well could have triggered some sort of a riot uh, or large protest that could have resulted in injuries or even deaths. So he's very lucky that this didn't, uh, uh, you know, evolve into something more significant uh, and end up being a lot more damaging than it was. Now, I've read quite a few stories today on this topic, as I'm sure many of you have, and I can't remember which story I read because I've read probably a half dozen or so. But now it looks like, of course, we know he pleaded not guilty. Uh, he did plead not guilty to all charges. And it looks like um, that uh, just from one story I read, it looks like he is going to claim that he has a drug problem and he's going to blame his drug addiction on his behavior. But I don't think that's going to work here uh, because this was a planned, premeditated, thought out, worked out uh, crime. And uh, so he can't say, well, he just you know happened to be too jazzed up on some kind of drug and he wasn't in his right mind and did something that he shouldn't have done because he wasn't you know, uh, you know, know, all together because of the drugs. But in this particular case, it's going to be very hard because this, this, this involved uh, two different main crimes. Of course, the sending a letter to himself uh, and uh, then a week or two later, he puts together this fake attack. These are very well thought out things, very well planned. So I just don't think that the drug addiction uh, is going to be uh, is going to is going to do it. I really don't. I don't think it's going to help him at all. In fact, it might hurt him. <laughs> quite honestly, I mean, you know, it's bad when you have to go into court and your defense is that you were on drugs <laughs> and that you have a drug addiction. That's probably not good. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, this is um, this is turning out pretty much uh, the way that I thought it might. Um, a few days back, I you know, I smelled a rat from the very beginning. That's why I stayed off of this story for. A solid week when everyone else was talking about it I didn't because I thought you know there's there's something going on here and I'm just gonna wait and see what what falls out here because the cops are, are digging into this they got a lot of people on it we're gonna learn some things uh, here and uh, I just found it very hard to believe in the very beginning that there was a couple of white guys wearing MAGA hats in an urban part of Chicago <laughs> you know first of all if you do want to really get mugged put on a couple of white guys go to urban part of Chicago and put on a couple MAGA hats and go walking down the street in the bar district at about midnight and see how that works out for you. <laughs> I'm kind of thinking the guys who would actually get mugged in this case wouldn't be, you know, Smollett. It would be the white guys in the MAGA hats <laughs> would probably have a lot better chance of getting mugged than he would. Um, so, anyhow, yeah, this is turning out pretty much the way I thought it would and I think it's going to get worse. Uh, we have to assume that he's obviously uh, not going to be on this show anymore because unless they're going to go shoot the scenes from prison because that's ultimately where he's going to be. And, um, you know, I, I just think in this particular case, normally a privileged person like this, a Hollywood-type person, a guy with a lot of money, 
uh, they would be able to. He's also very apparently friends with the Obamas, uh, various politicians. So he's got friends in high places that are obviously going to be trying to uh, pull some strings for him. But I, I just think at this point um, that the Chicago police have really got it in for this guy, and I don't think there's going to be very many people because of the nature of the crime and what he did and, and the whole nine yards. It's just a very ugly crime, you know. So. Uh, I don't think there's going to be much mercy for this dude, and I think he's probably going to get uh, some fairly stiff uh, penalties, and and he should. Uh, this was a, this was just a, a disgusting, um, you know, act on his part. And um, like I said, it could have been a lot worse. He's very lucky that it didn't result in uh, protest or riots that ended up with uh, there being victims or things like that. So he he might be actually quite lucky. And as far as his drug problem, obviously what he's trying to do here with his defense to say that he's got a drug problem, he's going to try to get, his lawyer is going to try to get the uh, judge to not send him to a federal prison, but rather to send him to like a rehab. Oh, he's going to get rehab all right, because I'm pretty sure he won't be getting, I hear his drug of choices, choices ecstasy. Uh, so I hear that uh, that's the case. So if that's true, that ecstasy is the drug that he's talking about, uh, I don't think he'll be finding any ecstasy in prison. Um, and it's really strange. I don't know anything about ecstasy. I wouldn't know it if I saw it. Uh, but, I mean, I thought ecstasy was kind of like a, I don't know, like a hallucinogen or a speed or something like that. And I wasn't aware that you could build up or develop an addiction to that kind of a drug. But, you know, I could be wrong. I don't know anything about that kind of drug. But um, we'll see where this goes. But I don't think that his defense is going to play very well. Uh, for the judge and the jury, and I think this guy is going to get the book slapped at him. I really do, and he will deserve every single bit of it. He's a louse. Well, uh, it appears that this that the um, person who leaked Michael Cohen's financial records to the creepy porn lawyer Michael Avenetti uh, has turned out to be an IRS intelligence analyst. An IRS intelligence analyst. His name is John Fry. And uh, he has been charged with the leaking of the uh, Michael Cohen financial records. They tried to work out a plea deal with him, and he's not biting on the plea deal. And that's very interesting that he would not bite on the plea deal. Uh, that raises a lot of questions. It reminds me of uh, the, the most recent uh, guy, what's his name, who was leaking the stuff to the uh, journalist. Uh, he did the same thing. And what this tells me is that there's probably more to this story and more people, possibly more high-profile people behind this act than just Mr. Fry. So I'm going to put this uh, story on the, uh, in the category of more to come. More to come. I think that this is not going to stop with Mr. Fry. I think that there's probably some, some people around him or above him uh, who he may feel are going to be in... Uh, some sort of jeopardy, and that's probably what he's going to use as his leverage. It's probably why, that's the only reason I can think of why he wouldn't cut a plea deal. He thinks he can get a better deal. And um, so I would think that this is another one of these cases uh, that there's going to be more uh, coming on this case. But that's what we know now. This is the guy who leaked the financial records uh, to Avenetti. And we still haven't found out who leaked the... Um, Michael Flynn Kislyak conversation. I hope Mr. Barr gets to the bottom of that. And I would not be surprised if that was McCabe or McCabe who directed that leak. Would not surprise me at all. Or Mr. Potato Head, John Brennan. Could have come from either of them. Or Clapper. Those, those would be my top three choices if I had to guess who orchestrated that leak of the Michael Flynn Kislyak uh, call. And I wish they would get to the bottom of that because I think you're going to find it's going to be someone pretty high level uh, to do that. Because no mid-level guy would leak on Michael Flynn. He was the you know national security advisor. Uh, so you got to have some big stones or feel like you're in pretty good shape. A bigger guy than him to do that. And so who would that be? Well, it would have to be someone pretty high up in the administration, head of the FBI, uh, maybe Clapper himself, the CIA, something like that. Someone pretty high up, I think, is the one who directed that leak of the Flynn Kislyak. And that's why I really hope that we get the answer to that question at some point. Well, we have uh, Chief Spreading Bull, Elizabeth Warren. She is now endorsing reparations 
for slavery. So that means we now have two candidates endorsing reparations for slavery. That would be Kamala Harris, who, of course, started her political career in the bedroom of Willie, uh, what's his name, the mayor of San Francisco, and, of course, Chief Spreading Bull. They both want uh, reparations for slavery. Um, in a national election, that would, that would probably cause you to lose about 48 states. So we'll see how that works out for them. And, of course, now we have the Democrats questioning whether or not Bernie uh, should be able to run as a Democrat because he's not a bona fide Democrat. And I was, again, before he threw his hat in the ring, I thought maybe that's why he hadn't done it yet is because they're trying to keep him from doing it. They supposedly put new rules in place, but apparently the only thing about the rule is is that he must sign some sort of a document saying that he, you know, is a Democrat. <laughs> So I guess uh, we'll see how that works out for them. But yeah, the uh, attacks on Bernie are, are going to begin, and uh, they'll continue coming. Ultimately, I think that um, ultimately I think that they are going to destroy Bernie, and they're not going to let him get the momentum he got last time. Just as soon as the Democrats, uh, the national Democrats, I mean the corporate Democrats, the donors, as soon as they decide who they want to be, uh, their their chosen uh, the ringer. As soon as we find out who the ringer is, which we probably will somewhere, somewhere around the uh, middle or end of April, that's when they'll drop the ringer on us, and we'll find out who that is. And at that time, uh, they will destroy Bernie. Uh, so they're starting early, but they will get a lot, they will get around to it. They got a lot. They got a lot on Bernie. Uh, just watch and see. Now his supporters don't care about that. So I mean, uh, they they will be able to uh, do some damage. But the 30 to 35, maybe 40 percent of hardcore Bernie commies, uh, I don't, you know, showing Bernie marching uh, down the street carrying the communist flag uh, would probably help him with uh, that group of folks. So I don't think I hurt him that much with his base, but they would hurt him. It would ultimately end up hurting him more in the general if he won. But quite honestly, I'm not so sure if the Democrats had their choice between Bernie and Trump, they'd probably rather have Trump. <laughs> At least ways they got someone to fight against uh for the next four years, as opposed to having to be uh, in the same party with Bernie as he's destroying the country, which will never happen, by the way. <clears throat> Bernie has zero chance. Zero. It's about votes. And Bernie can't get enough of them to beat Trump. So many of you saw this uh, uh, Sean Hannity show last night with Sarah Carter and John Solomon. Two stories they were talking about. One, the first one broke by Sarah Carter, and the other one was kind of one they were working on it together. And apparently, uh, someone has leaked some more of these, uh, the testimony of James Baker. I mean, this is like the third or fourth leak now of James Baker testimony. And this particular line of questioning that Sarah Carter got her hands on was the questioning by John Ratcliffe. Very, very good questions by John Ratcliffe. I almost wanted to write them all down and go through them, but we just don't have time, and you can do that for yourself if you'd like. Uh, you can go to a conservative treehouse, and they have the, the most of the transcripts there. But, uh, yeah, Ratcliffe was asking some very good questions of Baker, and in this particular line of questioning that uh, Ratcliffe had going, he was talking about the Rotten Reverend Clinton and the email investigation. And so we learn that James Baker originally believed that the rotten Reverend Clinton should have been charged for mishandling classified information. And Baker told Ratcliffe that Hillary's actions were alarming and appalling and that she could be charged with violation of the Espionage Act. But apparently what happened was there were a lot of uh, back and forth conversations, uh, arguments, I guess you could say, between uh, Comey and his people who wanted to get Hillary off the hook, and but Baker was kind of holding his ground and fighting for the idea that, hey, look, I mean, she violated the Espionage Act, man. I mean, here it is. There it is. Look at it. Look at what she's got. Look at this stuff that I've been looking at. Look at this uh, folder. Look at these emails. Look at what they're talking about. You cannot, you cannot not charge her under the Espionage Act for this. But apparently, he got beat down enough by all the other people, including mainly Comey, that... And then, of course, from his explanation to uh, Ratcliffe is that he was still, even though he had been taking a lot of heat because he's arguing that she should be charged 
while everyone else, the FBI and DOJ, said no, you know, she shouldn't be charged. They're having this argument, but then Comey comes out and does his press conference and says uh, no reasonable prosecutor would prosecute, at which point Baker really wasn't going to go rogue. He really had no choice but to uh, just uh, accept the uh, situation for what it was. And then Ratcliffe asked Baker if he still today believes that the rotten Reverend Clinton violated the Espionage Act and should have been indicted. And he said, yes. Yes. Not maybe. Not let me think about it. Not, I don't know. No, no, no. He had a one-word answer to that question to him, uh, from Ratcliffe was yes. He still believes to this day that the rotten Reverend Clinton violated the Espionage Act and should be indicted. The statute of limitations has not run out, Mr. Barr. It appears that Baker also told Inspector General Huckleberry Horowitz that the rotten Reverend Clinton should have been charged. Hmm. So that's very interesting to throw into the fray. As most of you know, I believe that the rotten Reverend Clinton is going to be indicted uh, at some point. I just don't see how it's possible not to. There's too many crimes. Too many crimes. And if Mr. Barr believes in equal justice under the law, there's no way that he can look at the case of the rotten Reverend Clinton, whether it be Clinton Foundation, Uranium One, Pay for Play, uh, Benghazi, uh, the emails destroying uh, evidence uh, that was under subpoena. There's just, you know, pick a crime, any crime. Plenty there. Jeff Carlson of the Epic Times points out a few things, again, regarding Andy McCabe and these interviews that he is doing. So Carlson points out uh, very well that McCabe is talking about he's briefing the Gang of Eight. He's staying in contact with certain members of Congress, keeping them briefed on the Russia investigation and things like that. But it's quite funny and that, uh, that he never, just as Jeff Carlson mentions, Jeff Carlson apparently never meant, or I mean, McCabe never mentioned to anyone, at least he's not admitted to this, has never admitted or said that, that he told any of these committees or congressional hearings or anyone, uh, the Gang of Eight or anyone else, about this 25th Amendment thing. Now, he's kind of backing away from that now. He's softening his position now. So, obviously, he's taking a lot of heat from that. My guess is is that Rodenstein's lawyers have contacted his lawyers and probably made it perfectly clear that he better be very, very careful. Very, very careful about these accusations he's making. And because uh, he's definitely backing away now from the Rodenstein 25th Amendment. And as Carlson points out, um, the fact that he was briefing Congress and essentially bragging that he was briefing Congress on these investigations. He never briefed them or said anything to them about the 25th Amendment coup. And that's something that's going to create a problem for him. He's got a lot of problems. And here's another problem. Comey told Trump three times. Comey told Trump three times to his face on one occasion that he was not being investigated. He was not being investigated. So how could Trump obstruct an investigation if he believed he was not under investigation? Why would he try to obstruct an investigation that he didn't know was even happening? And he was told it was not happening. So if you're told that by the FBI director that you're not under investigation, why would you need to obstruct something that you've just been told by the FBI director is not happening? That's a good question, don't you think? And if it was about other people that they were talking about being under investigation, why would Trump give a damn? Because if he doesn't like the way it turns out, he has the power of the pardon. The president can pardon anybody. He wouldn't need to deal with any type of obstruction to obstruct the investigation. If he, if he didn't like the way things were going or turned out or whatever, he could just pardon the individual. You see, the McCabe, entire McCabe narrative is being blown up literally day after day after day. Every day he talks, every day we blow up everything he just said. Day after day we've been doing this now since he started talking. This guy's going to jail. 
This guy's going to prison, and he's probably going to take a lot of people down with him. And that's good. So you can see more and more what we've been seeing, even going back to just when we were reading the emails from uh, Peter's been stroking us and loose Lisa Page. You could clearly see back then and the other emails that we've seen, uh, the other texts and things that we've seen regarding this topic, it's clear that there was a, a, like a jealousy going on, a fight literally going on over who was going to be in control of this whole investigation of which it appears now there was as many as three to as many as five different investigations, maybe more. But there was a lot of jealousies between these people and it's coming down to what looks like a battle between, it's like the FBI versus DOJ, with McCabe taking the FBI lead role in, 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 for the FBI, and Rodenstein is going to be the kind of the lead guy for the DOJ. And ultimately, when all the truth and all the facts uh, begin to pour out, especially if this ends up in a grand jury or something, which I think it probably will, this is going to be the uh, where this is going to go. It's going to be turned into a we, you know, they can't deny that these things happen because there's too much facts and evidence and witnesses uh, to prove it did. So then the only issue is going to be who was driving it, who was initiating it, who was taking the lead. And it appears that this is going to turn into an FBI versus a DOJ. Uh, they're going to line up behind each other and they're going to try to uh, scapegoat each other. What they're going to do in the long run is they'll end up all going down together, which is how it should be. <clears throat> Another thing that's a problem for uh, McCabe and the people on the FBI side, like Peter has been stroking us and Loose Lisa Page and, and, um, and Comey, the problem that they have, if, if they try to put this on Rodenstein, is that, keep in mind, Rodenstein was not even um, confirmed to be Deputy Attorney General until April of 2017. April of 2017. So in other words, he just got there the month before Comey was fired. When all this stuff was going down, he'd only been in this position for a couple of weeks. He probably hadn't even, you know, arranged his office yet. He was probably still getting moved into his office and getting, the, you know, comfortable with his new digs. He wasn't even up to speed on all this. He had been in Maryland as a U.S. attorney, completely out of the loop. A lot of the things and a lot of the crimes that took place, the ones that we focus on here, took place in 2016. And by the time we get to spring of 2017, that kicks off like the second round when Comey is fired. And, uh, but, but at that point, Rodenstein hadn't been around for any of the stuff that was happening in 2016. Rodenstein came into the game fairly late. And at the time when Comey was fired, Rodenstein had only been around for a couple of weeks. So that's going to make it more difficult for McCabe and the FBI to put it on Rodenstein. Trey Gowdy was on Fox. <clears throat> And he basically said that McCabe is a liar, and he's correct. McCabe is a liar. He's a big, fat liar. Lies constantly, but it's not going to work. And McCabe, or I mean, um, Trey Gowdy made the exact same conclusion that I came to. The exact same conclusion, the same exact thing I just said last night or the night before is exactly what Gowdy told Fox News. He said that McCabe can make an, alleg an allegation that he briefed the Gang of Eight, including Devin Nunes, because he knows that Nunes cannot respond. And you also get the impression um, from what Gowdy said, uh, he kind of agrees with me, that McCabe said nothing about the investigation into Trump. And again, if you look at Devin Nunes and what he's been doing and saying, and we've been following him very closely throughout this whole thing, uh, it's hard to believe based on what we hear and see from Nunes that he was told by, by McCabe that there was an investigation into Trump personally. I find it nearly impossible to believe based on Nunes, uh, you know, the way he talks and the things he said and he's trying to get to finding out these things. So the idea that, that he knew this and was told this is just, it just w doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And that's what Gowdy was also pointing out. Same thing I point out, that it, it, there's, there's, a, there's a problem. So while McCabe may say he briefed the Gang of Eight about the investigations, I don't think that he uh, said anything about two specific things. He's, I don't think he said anything about investigating Trump personally to the Gang of Eight. Or if he did, he briefed them individually and didn't tell Nunes. And I certainly don't believe, as we can 
what appears that he didn't ever say anything to them about this talk of a 25th Amendment coup. And of course, uh, he went on complaining about Adam Schiff, uh, asking, you know, what's the crime? Where's the crime? Where's the evidence? You need to put up or shut up. And that's true. But who pays attention to Adam Schiff, really? Come on. The guy's a moron. Well, the skateboarder, Robert O'Rourke, Bobby O'Rourke, says he's going to decide in 10 days if he will run for president. <laughs> well, uh, you know, he'll be laughed off the stage. So I would suggest if he has a, a lick of sense in his head, uh, he'll go back, to, he'll go find some other line of work because uh, he's not cut out for, for politics. He's a goof. Um, but his spokesperson is saying that Biden's people contacted him a while back and asked him if he would be interested in a VP slot. And so he says that uh, he is open to a VP slot. Yeah, I would love to see Biden and uh, Bobby the Skateboarder. <laughs> Bobby the Skateboarder and Biden. Now, you want to talk about a, a shit show. You want to talk about a campaign that could completely implode on itself. You put those two guys together and get them out talking. <laughs> boy, oh boy, that will be fun. I hope that happens. I hope it is um, uh, Uncle Joe the Perv uh, bite me along with uh, the skateboarder Bobby O'Rourke. That will be Fun stuff, my friends. Lots of laughs for all of us. We have James Clapper uh, going on MSNBC and telling them that the Mueller report might be anti-climatic. <laughs> yeah, you think so? Another thing uh, about this McCabe thing, and this is uh, just a note from yesterday I never got to, uh, I don't think I got to it, which should be really obvious to blow McCabe's whole story out of the water about this tale that he's weaving about, well, those eight days in May after Comey was fired, and he's having all these meetings, and he's talking to all these people, and they're all concerned about Trump being a asset of Russia or being played by Putin or any of this type of stuff. Keep in mind that... Uh, when Lisa, Lisa Page uh, was questioned uh, by Congress, she said that at that time of the Comey firing, they had not been able to prove a single thing about the evidence that they had been given about Trump colluding with Russia. There was zero evidence. And we have the text from, from Peter's been stroking us to Lisa Page, where she's talking to him about whether or not he's going to join the Mueller team. And he's like, eh, you know, and I, you and I both know if there's really no there there. In other words, Peter's been stroking us, did not believe it. At no time, at any time, when you look at all these people who are supposedly working on this, can you find at any time where any of them thought, ah, here's something, we got something now, we got something on Trump now, here's some connection. Never did this ever happen. So the idea that McCabe is still out there spinning this narrative that they were all concerned about what they were learning when in fact we keep learning from all the people who are actually, the people he's talking about are all saying, we didn't know anything. We had no proof of anything. We had no connections to anything. I mean, this guy is delirious, man. He's desperate. I mean, he's going to get his ass kicked in court. Uh, yeah, you know. So, anyway, there was a uh, question uh, on the last video. I think it was the last video. A very good question. Uh, a thought-provoking question by Timothy. And Timothy said, and these are not his exact words, but essentially what he said in his comment, he said, How can Barr look his colleagues in the face knowing that the entire senior leadership of the FBI and DOJ, which he is now over, were involved in such a devious criminal enterprise? It's a very good question. Uh, yes, how does Barr deal with this? And he comes into this job, and he knows all this because it's been going on for a long time. Clearly, the man reads the paper. He follows the news. He knows probably as much about, I don't think he watches my videos, but I, my guess is he's got friends on the inside of the DOJ. I'm sure he talks to. He's got friends at the FBI. He's got people friends in government that he talks to. He follows these stories very closely. And he certainly knows, uh, sort of to Timothy's point, that he's walking into a position where he's surrounded by some really bad characters. Now, many of these people who are involved in this have either been fired or have quit 
uh, or what have you. Uh, a lot of the main key players. But there's probably still a, a group of people there on the seventh floor, the DOJ and the FBI, who are uh, uh, dirty. And Barr certainly knows this. So to Timothy's question, it's a very good question. <clears throat> because if you take his question one step farther, because Timothy's asking, how can Barr walk in into the DOJ and now be the Attorney General and look around at all these people and know that there, there's so much corruption at, at the highest levels of the Department of Justice. How, 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 could, how, how, how how's this work out for him, you know? And so my thoughts on it, if you take this to the next conclusion, the next question you ask is, why would he take the job? I mean, here you have Barr. He's been the Attorney General already before. So it's not like it's a position he strived for all his life and he's finally getting it. He had this position 25 years ago. He occupied this position. <clears throat> he's been at a private law firm, one of the high dollar law firms for years now, making probably a seven high seven figure income. You have to assume he's financially secure. He doesn't need the money. And in fact, he's taking a, probably a huge pay cut by going to work as the attorney general. Why would he leave a seven figure salary at a law firm uh, where he doesn't have to put up with any of this bullshit to take a job where he knows he's going to walk right in to a hellstorm. I mean, he knows what he's walking into. It's not like Barr is, uh, you know, looking at this thing through rose-colored glasses and he didn't know that he was walking into a shitstorm. He knows exactly what he's walking into. He knows the the, the, the divisiveness of, of the two sides. Uh, he knows about the dirty players at the FBI and DOJ. He knows about all the evidence that continuously comes out, which proves that there was certainly, uh, at the very least, a, a lot of uh, criminal behavior going on, and even to the point of being a coup d'etat. So, to Timothy's question, how must he feel walking in here? Well, if he understood what he was walking into, then it tells me that he would not take the job. It, uh, one of two things. Either he believes that he is the guy that has to come in and save face for the DOJ uh, by coming in and trying to put the fire out. And maybe he sees himself as the fireman coming in to, you know, put the fire out, calm the waters, you know, serve up a few heads, make it all go away and preserve the integrity of the DOJ if, if they have any left. Or maybe he thinks that he has to come in and be the guy to clean house and that because he's been in the job before, he doesn't need the money. He doesn't need the credentials for his career. He's already made his career a long time ago. He theoretically, I mean, he, he could probably retire. Certainly he's financially secure. He could retire. He doesn't need the job. He obviously loves the job. He loves doing this type of work or he wouldn't still be doing it. Why would he come into the DOJ when it's in such a mess, knowing good and well that there's going to be tremendous pressure on him uh, just based on what he got in the hearings. Tremendous pressure on him to look again at Hillary Clinton and the crimes that she committed. Look uh, again at all the things that were done during 2016, 2017 and still to some extent continue to this day. Um, he certainly knows every bit of this. I mean, he's certainly aware, 100% aware of exactly what he's walking into. And so you know, either he's going in there because he believes that he has to save the reputation of the DOJ and he thinks that he can do that, or, and maybe he thinks that doing that is uh, to uh, reduce the amount of damage that's done to the DOJ as this process unfolds, or, on the other hand, he believes that he is the guy who will come in and, you know, uh, with the big guns and blow this thing out and take down all the perps and blow the whole thing up. Maybe he believes that's the way to fix the problem. We don't really know. One thing we do know uh, in regards to Timothy's questions, he definitely understands he's walking into a, uh, to a den of vipers, uh, a bunch of corrupt people, and he definitely understands that, that there are those who expect him to do something about it. Um, what he does about it and how he handles it is what remains to be seen. And once we see what he does, we'll probably have a lot better under, uh, idea of, of the answer to Timothy's question as far as what's going on, what's he thinking. We'll, we'll know that in probably about six months.
uh, when we see what he does, we'll have a better idea of what he was thinking. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, you guys have a good night, and I'll be back tomorrow with more Tower Gate. See you. Bye.